It's my pleasure to introduce our final speaker for the morning, uh, Dan Bresnitz. Dan is a professor in the Monk Chair of Innovation Studies with a cross appointment to the Department of Political Science at the University of Toronto. In addition, he's the co-director of the Innovation Policy Lab at the Monk School and director of academic research. Professor Bresnitz is known worldwide as an expert on rapid innovation-based industries and their globalization, and as well for his pioneering research on the distrib distributional impact of innovation policies. Innovation policy is a huge part of the government's economic policy, and indeed it's part of the renaming of Industry Canada. Uh, innovation policy figures uh, prominently as a result in our conference program this year. We appreciate Dan joining us to share his perspectives. Take it away, Dan. Thank you, Mark. Um, thanks. So, um, Mark, when I talked with Mark and I asked him what he would like me to speak about, he said, I really liked your three books. Can you talk about all of them in 20 minutes? So we'll see what will happen. So what I'm going to do today is basically talk very quickly about the global changes and the multiple pathways to success. And I'm going to talk from the point of view of a country or a region. Then I'll talk about the new roles for the state for policy in rapid innovation-based growth development, give a sample to make it more concrete of international successes, showing that even in some of the great success, what really happened is not that you reach the promised land and you can retire happily, but you actually create new challenges for yourself. Then talk about something that Canada has been playing or toying with, which is the idea of innovation policy agencies, meaning a public agency that is supposed to develop and implement said innovation policy. And then I would like to conclude by asking what does it really mean that we have choice because of globalization in the way we pursue innovation policy. So first, uh, if you look at the world in the last 20 or 30 years, what you see is different countries reaching great success based on their innovation, especially in the ICT industry. But if we look at those countries and we actually look at the industry, you will see a tremendous difference between any other period of industrial development. So let, let's look at an industry that I like, semiconductors, and we will just go through a few set of few countries that are really successful, so the United States, Korea, Taiwan, Israel, and China, what you will find that they all have very successful semiconductors industry. But then, as you focus on what is it that they do, you will find out that they specialize in very specific and very different stages. So all of you probably have products in your pocket or right next to you that have things from Israel, Taiwan, Korea, China, and the United States. Each one of them actually brought something else to the table. Uh, if you want to think about it, Israel and the United States focus on putting ideas on silicon. Taiwan focus on how to actually make those silicons work. Korea specialize in specific niches like memory. Um, and China then figure out how to make all of those different components into one actually working product in a price that the customer is willing to pay for. Um, what is also interesting, if you think about the world in this way, that it gives various entry point, and in each entry point, you need your region or your country to specialize in different sets of innovation. Another thing that is interesting, if you look at the world in that way, is that the first big country, the next superpower, that is the first to use that in order to industrialize, unlike any other country in the world, is China. China never 
needed to develop what Japan, for example, or South Korea did. When China entered industries, they could enter in a specific uh, points of entry and specialize on them and then grow up. They didn't need to create vertical companies. They did everything from day one. However, so the, the, the three things that I want you to think about, and I'll talk mainly about two, is that now we have production which is globally fragmented. So every product and service that we think about, we can do a map of the world, figure out where it is made, and what parts of the making, if you will, happens where. Second, you have a service transformation. Um, we just basically talked about some of it. But what happened in the service transformation, especially when we develop what a friend of mine, John Zeisman from Berkeley, called the algorithm revolution, you can take many services that were one time specially made gone, make them into routinized algorithm, and then sell them as products. And now with the cloud, sell them again, basically, back as services, which is a different thing from the rise of services if you look at national statistics, which basically Joe worked for me as General Motors cleaning my window. It was counted as production. Joe is now Joe cleaning services, cleaning the same window. It will now be counted as services. We're talking about a much more significant transformation, which what also it allows us to do is to raise productivity in services something that before the ICT revolution, we couldn't do. What happens is that the rapid innovation makes growth, if you think, again, from the point of view of a country, of a place, means that you have to have a different strategy of development. If you're Japan or South Korea in the past, and you wanted a car industry, you already knew what a car is. You knew how to make it. You knew who buys it and you can devise strategies around that. When your aim is really to have, as our prime minister claims, innovation policy, what you want from a point of view of a policymaker is to create and enable agents that will do something that by definition you don't know what it is, nor who will buy it and how they will sell it, and then stimulate them to do that, which is a completely different logic of action from the point of view of a state. And in doing that, what can the state or public, public policy do? First of all, it creates. I work in a university, for example. Part of my role is to create the people who will work for you developing new products. Second, I need to stimulate. As many of you know, we are in Canada punching above our weight in invention and scientific ideas and publication, but we're not doing very well innovation, actually taking those ideas, making them to products and services owned by Canadian companies that create profit. So you need to stimulate those people to do that, preferably inside your country, and sometimes the government actually need to step in. So in Taiwan, for example, even after the first company, semiconductor companies, was already making billions, no private investors were willing, Taiwanese private investors were willing to invest basically a few millions in the company that we now know as TSMC, which is the biggest pure play foundry of semiconductor in the world, and therefore the government using also the party, which back then was the government investment arm, was the main investor in the company, together with a small uh, foreign company called Philips. So those are the three things that are basically in your disposal that you need to do. Um, how and what do you need to do in order to create that industry, especially when you don't have to do it? First of all, partly what we talked about is the R&D market failure. So if you think about innovation from the point of view of private companies and individuals, because of the high uncertainty, 
because of the fact we are actually dealing with information, meaning people can then go and run with it. If I invented the wheel, everybody after me will use the wheel in their invention. You have what's called the R&D market failure, which means that under completely free market conditions, there'll be less innovation than what is good for the overall economy and society. That's why we have patent laws. That's why we have many governments directly investing in companies. The second is the local and global. Just think from yourself. If suddenly two guys or girls from Zambia will call you and we said, hey, we are in the university you never heard about. We just developed a thing which can really help you with your critical mission. What are the chances that you will even pick up the phone? Probably zero. However, if those guys come up as part of a government initiative, either when they go outside or when multinational come into the country, you have a chance of actually willing to talk with them and maybe investing in them. How state engage in those two things actually shape the creation of the capabilities and affect the development, what kind of business models actually work. But each choice path have consequences, development of specific set of capabilities, but not others. So each of the countries that we discussed actually have different strengths and weaknesses, and at least as important, different distribution of success. So many of you have heard about how Israel is unbelievably successful in innovation. What many of you might not have heard, that in those exact same years that Israel moved from being completely non-innovative to the world's greatest producers of successful startups per capita, Israel moved also from being the second most equal society in the OECD to the second most unequal society in the OECD, where one out of every five household is under the poverty line at the moment. So four critical decisions. If you think about skills, is how you produce them and where you produce them, like Canada, like Israel, like United States in the private market, or do you go like Taiwan and to a certain degree like Germany and they're actually in public research institutions. Resources, do you focus on specific industries or you go horizontal? And to what scale the government is actually investing? Second, foreign firms. There's two important things that happen with foreign firms. First, inside your national borders. An example here can be Ireland and Israel, in both of them, Intel became the biggest employer. But in Israel, Intel started from a small R&D center, and only after becoming quite successful, maybe now the second most important R&D center for, Israel, uh, for Intel in the world, it moves to production. In Ireland, it started from assembly manufacturing, basically boxes, moved to slightly more sophisticated activities. You run that experiment over 40 years, the kind of things that Intel wants from Israel, Israelis, suppliers, and companies, and the kind of people and information it releases to the local economy are completely different than what happened in Ireland. The second is outside the national borders. What kind of activities or supply relationship your local companies have with the leading multinationals when they go global. Are you just giving them a service? Are you just assembly for them? Or do you give them critical mission innovations? The same goes for foreign investors. So in Israel, for example, not only most of the money by government policy comes from outside the country, but also the government of Israel consider it a failure when the local companies go and uh, have its initial public offering on the local stock exchange. NASDAQ is good, Tel Aviv is actually considered a failure. 
the opposite is true about Taiwan. And again, because of those laws and regulation, different kind of business models are uh, being able to flourish in Israel and Taiwan. So let me move quickly to a few concrete examples. Israel, in 68, which is the first time Israel even thought about something we now call innovation policy, they didn't have a name for it. So they basically call it science-based industries. They found that in the whole entire civilian sectors, they have 886 R&D workers with any academic education. Can't see how many people we have here, but it's probably three times the amount of people we have in this room was the complete set in Israel. Between 78 and 86, this was the rate of inflation. It's not a spelling mistake. If you think for a moment about the name of a currency, it's the new Israeli shekel, because it started as the lira, like the Italian lira or the pound. It moved to the shekel, and within two or three years, the shekel was worthless, but they ran out of new ideas, so we just call it the new shekel. However, by the same years, or starting the same years, Israel moved by 2000 to have the largest number of high-tech firms on NASDAQ after the US and Canada. And now, by the way, I'm sorry to say as a Canadian, Israel is way above us. And by 2000, moving from having nothing, IT exports became not just big, but most importantly, 71% of industrial export and 70% of GDP growth. So for all purposes, the engine of the Israeli economy within 20 something years have become not just ICT, but startups. How this was done, as I said, they didn't know what innovation is, high tech as a category you even look at data in didn't exist. So we call it science-based industry. They decided that the government actually have no clue how to do it. Therefore, they will give money. They'll ask for project from companies. So the unit is a project. It's not even a company. Lower the risk, and basically the companies will know best what to do. And they really couldn't care less who owns it. As long as the R&D activities and the spillovers of those R&D activities stayed in Israel. So if it was an American multinational subsidiary doing R&D in Israel, it was treated just like it was an Israeli company for a point of view of government grants. The outcomes is that Israel has become basically the only place that really act like Silicon Valley outside the US. Both software, hardware, anything which is cool, Israel have a company. The challenge is, is when all your investors are American, all your or most of your customers are American, you're publicly listed in NASDAQ. You, in the end, if you're successful, look like an American multinational with an R&D subsidiary in Israel. And it's not at all clear whether you continue to grow and produce more good jobs for the United States or for Israel. Because all your sale, all your back office, all your headquarters, all your lawyers, all your financiers are actually in the United States. Um, it is not clear that Israel know how to build sustainable success. We're going to hear from one of the only companies that managed to do that. I think there's a speaker from Checkpoint right after me you will find it difficult to find more than three more checkpoints in the whole of the history of the Israeli high-tech industry. And as I said, growing inequality. Israel, if you're an Israeli, what you, and you're not in the high-tech industry, what you got from this success is that your country looks more like Mexico than anywhere else in the world right now in terms of inequality. Not necessarily the best deal. 
And the other thing is, what is next for Israel after ICT? Is there anything else? Finland. Again, we might not think about it, but until the late 80s, Finland was basically a pet of the Soviet Union, which did most of its trade with the Soviet Union, and it wasn't even in money. It was barter. And then suddenly, the Soviet Union was no longer there. Within one year, the economic crisis in terms of output and unemployment is more severe than what happened in 2008 to any economy in Europe. The recovery, we all know about it. And Finland is one of the most, considered the most innovative in terms of not just high tech, but also traditional industries. Their pulp and paper industry, if you went to Finnish forests in the early 2000s, like I did, the Internet of Things was already there completely, and all of it was invented and produced in Finland. How did they do it? They completely, thanks to the crisis, managed to reconfigure the whole innovation system, push a lot of money into what I called capacity creation and stimulation, and trying to internationalize Finnish firms. Great success, but built mostly around one company. And while, if you look at the impacts now on Helsinki, you will see that around Aalto University, uh, how many of you play uh, games on your uh, mobile phones or tablets? No one play games in this crowd. Oh, I see one. You might have heard about a game called Angry Birds or Crash of Clan. All of them come from Helsinki. And enough people are now employed in Helsinki that they're actually more in number than what there were in Nokia. But those are very different people. And it is not clear what happens outside Helsinki and how sustainable is this employment. And whether the innovation policy that was so successful in creating Nokia actually fit what Finland has to do now. So, if you think about those two stories, what you will also find out that the agencies, the part of the state that actually was crucial and make it happen, was not a major ministry. It was not maybe the second or third most important ministry. And the prime minister was not holding the hand of a minister and industry leaders and saying, innovation is our future. As a matter of fact, it was in the periphery. And the reason is that you didn't, as, as we said, a different logic of policy which means that you need a commitment in terms of policymakers to a continuous uh, process of policy experimentation. So as Canadian, we all know that one of the most difficult things for a government to do is to come up with new policies. Almost impossible. It's even worse if you need to come up constantly with new policies and kill old policies. Can you just imagine our prime minister or minister saying, here is a new policy, this would lead us to great growth, and then nine months later said, you know what, it was a horrible mistake, we need to close it down now and move all the money to a new idea. It's difficult as it is for CEOs to do that. Can you imagine what happened when you're on the global main, the national, and all the TV and you promised your voters. Uh, because of that, you need to be, most of it needs to be hidden actually. Constant experimentation and only when they scale up and become successful, you get approved or be known all night. And you need radical ideas. So you actually cannot work with the already well-known and they're already quite, uh, I wouldn't say stale, but at least quite well-reversed ideas. You know this is not going to happen. And you have three functions. 
you need to identify the ideas, you need to target different actors and activities, you need to engage in private public partners to implement, test and validate them, and you need to redefine the mission. It's one thing to be successful when you have no industry, it's something else altogether when your countries now have more startups on NASDAQ per capita than anywhere of the world by far. The reality check is, as we in Canada think about innovation policy, how many of those agencies and policies were created? How many of them actually were successful? Can you think about any success that came from a central minister with a blessing of a prime minister? And if not, can we think on the political, in the political situation that we now have in Canada of anywhere to allow our new Ministry of Innovation, Science and Economic Development to actually consciously experiment? And if not, a question is, can the provinces do something? And we can think about at least two great successes, Austria in Alberta and the NRC plant biotech, which created what we know as canola, which the rest of the world probably not, do not remember, but we know stands for Canadian oil. The question is, are there one time, those efforts by Frontex a one time wonder or something we can build on? So in a way of conclusion, I will say that one of the main fault that I think we have in Canada, but we are not alone, is that we imitate and copy things that work somewhere else instead of doing what you really need to do, which is not to say I need innovation but I said, this is the society I want to have. How can we use innovation, innovation policy to reach there? Because otherwise, you don't have a map of where you want to reach. And if you don't have a map of where you want to reach, how are you going to reach anything that you actually want? Second, you need to understand who you are, what are your core strengths and weaknesses, and think where you want to be in this global world of fragmented production. Do you want to be Taiwan, Germany, or Silicon Valley? And the answer is not at all clear. Then you devise innovation policies. And then you have to remember that innovation is a long-term game. We in Toronto just announced the new Institute for Artificial Intelligence. Let's assume that tomorrow students enter this institute and start to work on new technologies. It is at least five years before they are trained to the level that all of you can actually hire them and they'll be useful. Which means that it is at least seven years of the people that entered actually influencing Canadian industry. And that's just one example. Therefore, what we need to understand is that money is not the key. It is actually not helpful to spend five billion in two years and then stop. It is much more important to figure out that we are here for the long term and saying this is the money we have and we are going to invest it in innovation and constant experimentation every year for the next 20 to 30 years. Otherwise, the next government that comes will change everything, everything will stop, and then 10 years from now, Mark will invite me here to talk about why Canada doesn't have successful innovation policy. Uh, and with that, I'll stop. Um, Mark, do we have time or not? No. Okay. Fabulous, thank you, Dan. Thank you. Wow. I don't know about you, I, I didn't have professors like Dan when I was in school, and uh, uh, Dan had a lot of really important messages. I was just trying to picture how the Globe and Mail, and certainly the National Post, would handle the current government saying, okay, let's 
try redoing this policy that we just announced. So uh, the Toronto Star would probably accept it um, as, as being pretty good. But uh, thank you so much for sharing your views and perspectives, and uh, we'll make sure everybody knows where to pick up Dan's books, and uh, certainly watch for his articles and op-eds in your local paper. Thank you. Sure.